uh, we're happy to have uh, Young Ho Yo from Georgia Tech uh, finish off this semester's discrete math seminar by talking about approximating TSP walks in subcubic graphs. So let me hand over the laptop to you. Thank and you, Stephen. And yes, I apologize for uh, the technical difficulties. Uh, but yes, I'll be talking about TSP walks, and this um, this is joint work with Michael Weigel, who's a graduate student at Georgia Tech and Shengxin Yu, who is our advisor. All right. So the main motivating problem for our talk is the is is a, this famous problem known as a traveling salesman problem. So the problem is given a complete graph where you um, you have distances or these costs on the edges. You want to find a tour or a spanning cycle of minimum length. So this is a, a very well-known problem, uh, intensely studied pro problem in computer science and, and operations research. And th this is uh, um, there's a, a special case that is uh, particularly important, and that, that's the metric TSB, where the distances form a metric. In other words, um, going from U to V can cannot cost any more then going from U to W and then to V. So taking a detour can only cost you more. And this is a natural assumption in many real world applications. And so th this is a, again, this is an, a very widely studied problem and there are even further special cases of this problem. So now, instead of just assuming an arbitrary metric, what if all the edges have, what, what if all the distances come from some underlying graph where the minimum, um, the shortest path between these two vertices is the distance between these two uh, vertices. Right? So again, so the distance between U and B is the shortest path uh, given some underlying graph. So this is called the graphic TSB. And even further, there are special cases where we, for the graphic TSB, we restrict the cubic and subcubic graphs for the underlying graph. Okay, and it's just a sequence of specializations and it should um, in principle be easier, but these are of course all NP hard. So they're all NP hard to solve exactly. And in fact, they're all NP hard to even approximate within a certain factor. So let's first look at the traveling sales, the general traveling salesman problem. So this is the general problem is of NP hard to approximate within any fixed constant factor. And it's not difficult to see that if you allow these arbitrary weights um, then within then, um, any constant factor approximation would let you solve the Hamilton, Hamilton cycle problem in, in under the graphs. So you cannot have, hope for a fixed constant factor approximation for the general TSP. But for the metric TSP, um, it, you, it is possible to have a constant factor approximation, but it is not, you cannot do better than 123 over 122. So it is known that you cannot approximate uh, the shortest length of a TSP walk or a closed tour within, the, within this factor of the optimum unless P is equal to NP. And even in the special case of the graphic TSP, um, it's still in, in approximable but with a slightly better constant. And even when you get to subcubic and cubic TSP, it's still in approximable within some uh, constant factor. All right, but, uh, but there's this famous algorithm of, of, of Christophides that um, I'm sure mo most of, most of uh, people here will know that you can do a three halves approximation for a general metric TSP. All right, so this is what a beautiful algorithm from the 70s is. It's a very old algorithm, but it's, it's a very elegant and, and a nice combinatorial algorithm that, um, that will give you a, a tour that is guaranteed to be at most 1.5 times the optimal tour given any metric instance, right? And this was, um, despite many years of research, um, this three halves uh, ratio was not improved upon for almost 40 years for any non-trivial case of the TSP, of the, of the metric TSP. And it was only in 2005 that this three halves uh, ratio was improved just slightly to three halves minus five over 389. And this was for the very, very special case of the cubic graphic TSP and further only on three connected cubic graphs. So this was in 2005 and this was considered a, a big, big breakthrough at the time that you could, you could ever beat this three halves ratio 
And part of the reason that um, people thought it maybe it wouldn't be possible to beat this three halves, um, which may, uh, maybe is part of the reason why it took so long to beat this bound is that like this Christophides algorithm was so nice and beautiful that people thought maybe this was like the right algorithm and that it might not be possible to do better. But it turns out you could, you could do better. And this was the first uh, breakthrough result. Okay, and following this, there was a, a sequence, there was sort of like an, a flurry of, of activity on this problem. So following this result, for the general graphic TSP, they also Im improved on this three halves ratio by a tiny bit, uh, so even a smaller amount. But this was also considered a, a, a breakthrough for the general graphic TSP, not just the cubic graphs. Okay, and, and afterwards, shortly afterwards, this was improved to a, a, a more significant constant to 1.461 by Monke and Svensson. And Mucha, he actually showed that this same algorithm of Monke and Svensson yields a, a 13 over nine approximation just by improving the analysis. And this was further improved to seven over five uh, by Sable and Beigen. And at, at currently, this is the, the state of the art. So for a general graphic TSP, the best currently known bound is 7 over 5, which is, is 1.4. And so it, it is a significant improvement over this 3 halves approximation that stood for a very long time. But for the general metric TSP, um, the 3 halves uh, ratio stood for e uh, even, even longer. And, it was only about a year ago that this three halves ratio was improved to three halves minus 10 to the minus 36. And this, so this was just a year, about a year ago that this was um, published. And this won the best paper award at, at, the, at Stock, which is the, one of the top CS conferences. So this, this is also considered a big breakthrough result that you can improve this three half ratio for the general metric TSP. Okay, but so for this talk, we'll be focusing on cubic graphs and subcubic graphs. So let's first discuss, okay, why do we even care about cubic and subcubic graphs? So one reason is that they're, so they're the simplest classes of graphs where the, all of the hardness of the TSB still persists. So it is still NP-hard and it's, it's still NP-hard to approximate within um, on, uh, uh, a small constant vector. But there's another very important reason for caring about cubic and subcubic graphs, which comes from the standard um, linear programming relaxation of the traveling salesman problem. So this is called a software, software elimination linear program, where you put weights on the edges. So um, we're trying to solve this linear program where you put, we, we should think of it as an integer program where for each xe, I put a one to, to indicate that I include this edge in my tour and zero to indicate that I do not include my edge in this tour. So I want to minimize the sum uh, of the weights on the edges or the distance on the edges that I'm using. And I want to sort of give linear constraints to ensure that the edges that I pick satisfy this tour um, constraint. So first of all, I want to make sure that for every vertex, um, I have exactly two edges coming out of that each every vertex. So for each every vertex, I look at the, the set of edges um, incident with that vertex and X. So I, I need to use exactly two of those um, edges. But just having this first condition alone will, will only yield you um, these distant unions of cycles. So I need to make sure I, I only have one cycle. And one way to get around that is to say, okay, if I look at any subset of the vertices, there should, not, there's, there should always be at least two edges coming out of that subset. So there can't be any two disjoint components and that, that's encoded in the second constraint here. And the third constraint is just to say X is, is non-negative. So this is sort of the, um, one of the most standard linear programming formulations of, of the TSP. And of course, so if we impose a, an integer constraint on the XEs, and this solves the, the TSP exactly. But of course, we relax it to a linear program and see what, what we can do with the linear program that we know how to solve. And, and it's, there's a very famous conjecture that this linear program will all, always give you something that is within four thirds. Or in other words, 
the actual optimal integral tour is always within four thirds of the optimal value of this linear program. So this is another long-standing conjecture in this in this in this area that this linear program relaxation will only um, make will only um, improve the optimal value by uh, this certain four thirds amount. Okay, and, and again, why do we care about subcubic graphs? It, it happens to be the case that this four thirds approximation or this four thirds in integrality gap is achieved by subcubic graphs. In other words, subcubic graphs, they in fact exhibit the worst case behavior in, 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 the, in this context of this subtotal elimination in your program. And here is the example that, that shows that you can get this four thirds ratio. So I take three long paths of, of the same length and I put uh, two triangles at the, at the two ends. And I put all ones on the paths and I put halves on the triangles. This graph with this edge weighting satisfies all the constraints in this linear program. But, um, but the optimal tour has to um, use each of these paths. Well, it has to use, has to cross from left to right four times, essentially, because uh, uh, if you wanna, um, if, if you, so basically you're looking for a spanning closed walk in this graph, you have to cross this, these, these three paths four times, an even number of times. Uh, and because there's three of them, you have to cross at least four times, which means um, if the path, if the length of the path is roughly K, then the, the optimal value of the TSP walk, in, the integral TSP walk will be roughly four thirds or four times K. But of course, the, if you sum the XEs here, you will get roughly three K. So the subcubic graphs, they really exhibit the worst case behavior. So this is, this is really the primary reason for focusing on these subcubic graphs. So what progress has been made for cubic and subcubic graphs? So then the, the first result, first breakthrough on this three half ratio was on three connected cubic graphs. This was improved, so partially motivated by this four thirds integrality gap conjecture. Um, they showed that for three connected cubic graphs, you can actually do a four thirds approximation. Okay, and again, this was um, considered for a while to be a, a natural barrier, but it, it turns out, oh, sorry, I should have. So it, this was actually extended to two connected cubic graphs. And it, this was also extended to two connected subcubic graphs. So for subcubic graphs, it's actually, it's actually considerably more difficult than just looking at cubic graphs, but this, this, was, this was done. But in 2015, they also broke through this four thirds ratio. So they improved, they broke through this barrier, this natural barrier of four thirds by a tiny amount. And, and independently, um, Zulin also broke through this barrier. And once you break through this barrier, of course, other people um, work on it to improve the ratio even further. So this was further improved to 1.3 and to nine over seven, most recently by Tvoja, Kral, and Mohar. And our work, uh, our talk today here is to improve this bound even further for cubic graphs from nine over seven to five over four. So it's, it's not a big improvement. So it's nine over seven is about 1.28 and five over four is what, about 1.25. So it's about a 0 0.03 improvement. Uh, so let me remark that. So for cubic graphs, we have all these um, improvements, but for subcubic graphs, we, we're still stuck at four thirds. We still have not broken through this four thirds bound for subcubic graphs. Okay, so let for the rest of the talk, let me try to give you an idea of how we prove this five fourths approximation result. So it's it's really um, just a, a purely mostly a, a graph theoretical result. Um, we don't apply any sort of fancy algorithmic approximation techniques. We just prove a, a, a general bound on the length of TSP walks in cubic graphs and, and subcubic graphs. So the way we do that, so let me state our main theorem. So given a graph G, we're gonna denote by TSP of G as the minimum length of a TSP walk, or in other words, um, the minimum length of a spanning closed walk. So a closed walk, which visits every vertex. 
And our main theorem is that given a simple two connected subcubic graph with n vertices and n two vertices of degree two, the, t the minimum length of a TSB walk is bounded by five n plus n two over four minus one. Okay, and moreover, such a TSP walk we can find in polynomial time just by essentially following the proof. So we can construct such a TSP walk. This that's guaranteed to be at most five n over five n plus n two over four. And, and in particular, if you give me a cubic graph that has no vertices of degree two, then I'm going to my algorithm is going to return a, a tour of length five n over four because n2 would be zero if you gave me a cubic graph. So naturally, we, this, 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 this theorem just um, yields a five-fourths approximation for cubic graphs, even though our, our actual main result is more general for subcubic graphs. But also let me note here that if you give me a general subcubic graph, we do not get a fourth-thirds approximation for, for this result. Uh, what we get, because n2 could be very large. If n2 is very close to n, then this is actually closer to three halves, which is not an improvement. Although um, it is possible to modify our arguments to essentially recover a four thirds result, but we, we still don't know how to break through the four thirds barrier for subcubic graphs. So this was actually conjectured by um, Dvorak, Kral, and Mohar in, in their previous paper where they proved the nine seventh approximation ratio. And, and this bound is actually best possible. So in particular, there are infinitely many subcubic graphs that achieve this bound exactly. And even if you restrict the cubic graphs, there are infinitely many that achieve this bound exactly minus one. So I can't get a minus one, but there are infinitely many that achieve minus two. So the, the, the five fourths um, constant is best possible in terms of a general bound for the length of the TSP walks. Okay, and moreover, we actually characterize um, the extremal cases. So we characterize all the graphs where the TSP, the minimum length of a TSP walk has length exactly this amount of five n plus n two over four minus one. Okay, and, and just one quick note here is that um, this requirement that the graph has to be simple is necessary. Um, so if you take a disjoint, internally disjoint union of three, very long paths that are that have the same endpoints, but now if you double sort of the the every other edge in the path so that every vertex um, in the path is incident with uh, two parallel edges, it turns out that violates this bound. So the simpleness condition is is necessary. So our main um, idea is to consider even covers of G where um, an even cover we define as a vertex disjoint union of cycled and isolated vertices. So let me remark that um, in, in previous, in most um, previous works on the TSP, the way we obtain an approximation is um, sort of to, to first find a spanning Eulerian graph, a spanning connected Eulerian graph, and then try to remove vertices to, to obtain an approximation. Here we're doing something, um, so we're doing it from the other side where we start with something, um, start with a, a spanning but not connected. We, we can have many isolated vertices. We just start with some even spanning graph that has many different components and we just try to connect these even components. So given an even cover, so it just for an even cover, we should think of um, different unions of cycles and isolated vertices. Given such an even cover, how do you construct a TSP walk or a spanning closed walk out of an even cover? The way you do it is you just make a spanning tree out of these cycles and isolated vertices where you treat each cycle as a single vertex. So when you, when you add, so you, you're making a spanning tree. Um, so what is the length of the TSP walk that you get out of this even cover? Well, when you add one isolated vertex, you're forced to repeat the vertex that you left from to reach that isolated vertex. And if you add a cycle, you're forced to re uh, repeat the vertex that you left from in the original graph, but you also repeat the vertex in the new cycle. So we define the excess of an even cover to be two times the, two times the number of cycles plus the number of isolated vertices. And it turns out that um, 
given any uh, simple subcubic graph, the minimum length of a TSP walk is exactly equal to the minimum excess of the graph plus n minus two. So we're really, um, this is an exact relation. Um, given a TSP walk, I can give you some uh, um, even cover that has length at most, that I mean, under this relation has uh, length at most, the t length of the TSP, TSP walk minus n plus two and vice versa. And again, the, the, the picture you should have in mind is that given an even cover, a distant union of cycles and isolated vertices, you make a spanning tree out of it. And each time you add, so you induct on this spanning tree, on, on the leaf of a spanning tree. And every time you add a vertex, you add one. You're, you're forced to repeat one vertex. And every time you add a cycle, you're forced to repeat two vertices. So we're really only going to work with these even covers. And it, it is also known that you can, given an even cover, you can, you can convert it to a TSP walk in, in linear time, actually, uh, because you're really just finding a spanning spanning tree. So again, what we want to prove is that the, the minimum length of a TSP walk is at most 5n plus n2 over 4 minus 1. But we, 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 but we just showed that this, um, the length of a TSP walk is exactly the minimum excess of the graph plus n minus two, where the excess of an even cover is defined to be, could be two times the number of cycles plus the number of isolated vertices. So, so just, just to rephrase as this result, what we're actually going to show is that given a simple two connected subcubic graph, I can find you an even cover of, of excess this amount. I'm just rephrasing, uh, plugging in this formula for our, our, for our main theorem. So let me try to, um, so what, what, what is our sort of main key idea? We're actually going to prove a stronger statement than this by asking our even cover to go through a specified edge or avoid a specified edge. So let, let's, so suppose we're given such a graph G and, and, an, and some specified edge, e, just any edge in the graph. What if I ask for an even cover to contain this edge in a cycle? Is it still possible to achieve this bound for even covers that contain this cycle? And it turns out the answer is no. So this, this example is to look at K4 minus or the graph obtained from K4 by deleting one edge. Okay, and if the edge, if my specified edge is the one edge that has degree three vertices on both ends, then it turns out, so, if this, this was really, so I, I have an edge and I have two internally disjoint paths of, with one vertex, one internal vertex in each of those paths. And I'm forced to use the middle edge, which means I have to use one cycle and one isolated vertex for the other path. So every even cover using this specified edge has excess three. But of course, if you calculate this value n plus n2 over four, you get three halves. So the minimum excess is this n plus n2 over four plus three half. So it violates our desired bound by a half. So that's maybe not good, but it only violates by one half. So that's manageable. Now, what if we ask for an even cover to not contain this edge? Well, the, we, we still don't get a bound. And in, in this case, actually the, the situation situation is much worse because if you just take a long cycle and just pick an edge and I ask you to not contain this edge, then you're forced to use every single vertex as an isolated vertex. There's as the only, you, you can't contain any cycle because your graph is just a cycle. So but that's sort of a, but that, that's, that's a bit um, trivial. So now what if you ask, what if you're, you delete the edge and you're still, too connected. What if G minus E is still too connected? Can you still, can you then prove this bound? Can you find an even cover not containing E um, that satisfies this bound? And the answer is still no. So now if you take K23, so you should think of it as two vertices and you, you have three internally disjoint paths, each with one internal vertex. But now I add an additional edge between two of the degree two vertices. But of course, I'm asking my even cover to not go through this edge. So again, by um, if, 
if, if my event cover is not allowed to contain my this new edge, then I again have to contain two, two of these paths in a cycle and one isolated vertex. So the excess is still equal to three and n plus n2 over four is still three halves. So this again violates the bound by, by a half. But our key idea here is that, well, so K23 plus an edge is really bad if you force it me to not contain the edge. But in this case, if I ask it, if I allow it to contain the edge, then I can actually do a lot better. I can, it becomes a, a, a Hamiltonian graph. I can cover the entire graph with one cycle. Similarly, in, in the previous case with the K4 minus an edge, if, I, if I'm forced to go through this middle edge, then I have to have excess three. But if I then allow it to not go through that edge, then I can, again, cover the whole graph with one cycle. So what we prove is that, so if you force it to go through an edge or if you force it to avoid an edge, you might violate this bound by a half. But then you can, in that case, you can save a little bit on the other case. So the, these two quantities should balance out. If you force it to go through an edge or not through an edge, these two quantities should balance out. They can't both be very bad, All right? So again, in, in each of these cases, you can save a bit on the other side. And what we actually show is that um, we, we, we prove separate bounds. So we prove separate bounds for each of these two cases. And we again, characterize the extremal cases extremal examples in both of the, both of these, um, with both of these constraints. Um, all right, so this is our actual main theorem. So let, let's assume just for simplicity that G minus E is two connected. So we, we don't want these examples where G is just a cycle and E is just one of these. Deleting E gives you a lot of these um, cut edges. So let's just assume that G minus E is two connected. Then what we can prove is that if you force me to go through an edge, then I can find you an even cover with um, of size at, or with excess at most this much uh, of, with at, at most a uh, plus three halves. Instead of plus one, I allow three halves. And similarly, if, I, if I'm forced to avoid an edge, then I can, I can again prove a bound of at most plus three halves. Okay, and moreover, the really important thing here is that these two um, parameters balance out. So how do I formalize that? Well, one way to write it is like this. So I really want to focus on these plus three halves or plus constant. So if I look at the plus constant in the first case, and I also look at the, plus, the constant in the second case, those two constants sum up to at most two. So if this is three halves here, then the other case, well, I will get a, a one half. And if I get a three halves by not containing the edge, then I'll get a one half by containing the edge, at most one half. And, and really for, for, um, for most of our work, we really just focus on these additive constants after n plus n two over two. So I, 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 I'm not going to define a lot of notation. Well, I, I try to avoid uh, defining a lot of notation, but this is a very important notation for this talk. So we'll define these deltas and hat deltas as these additive constants after n plus n two over four. Um, but there, there's this little weird thing here where I subtract minus two when, so delta is when I'm, I'm forcing the even cover to go through an edge and hat delta is when I force it to not go through the edge. And I'm going to subtract two in, in the definition of a delta because well, okay, so what, what the, to, to rephrase our main theorem in, in terms of these deltas, what, what we're showing is that delta of G and E is always at most minus one half. The hat deltas are always at most three halves. And the two deltas for a given pair G and E, they always sum to at most zero. So, okay, why are we doing this minus two in the definition of delta? So, um, it's sort of, well, first of all, it leads to much simpler computations when we do the actual calculations. And the reason is we're going to be piecing together these um, sort of chains of, of um, sort of blocks or chains of graphs. And we're going to combine all the cycles um, of each block 
that contain um, we're going to we'll, we'll be combining the, the cycles of each block. So we have these let's imagine you have like a chain of, of blocks and I want a cycle that goes through this chain then I, I, I sort of I can take like a closure of each block I force a, an even cover through this I, I join the end vertices of this block I force an even cover through this new edge and I, I, I get a sequence of even covers of each block and I can I combine each of the cycles in each block but of course the, the excess of the even cover in each block uh, contains this cycle, but, but the cycle is not actually going to be used in the overall graph. So I'm going to take away the, the, the cycle in the smaller block that is just used as a path in the overall chain. So I mean, that's sort of the intuition and it actually has a, a, a natural interpretation as sort of the savings of going through the block and the cost of not going through the block. Um, so let me try to formalize this intuition a little bit. So again, this is just a definition of the deltas. So suppose I give you, a, I, I, I'm given a specified edge E, and let's suppose that this edge is in the two edge cut. Okay, so now let's, I, this two edge cut defines two connected components if I delete the two edges. And now let's close up each of the two components. So um, I, I, I don't think I have a picture for this. But. So imagine you, I, I think the idea, hopefully the idea is clear. I have two edges kind of, um, dividing the graph into two components. For each component, I just close up the two, ed, two um, ends of the two, the two edge cut. All right, and so, sort of the, the things that thing that really makes this work or hopefully intuitive is that the delta of the overall graph going through this edge E is just a sum of the deltas of the, each of the closures. And similarly, the hat delta of the overall graph not containing E is so the sum of the hat deltas. So, it, so the, really the idea is that if you think of one side of the cut as being the main part of the graph and one the other side as being some small part that, I, I, that I'm, I'm trying to decide whether or not I should go through this part or not go this, through this part. And the deltas tell me, if I go through this, this part and I save um, what, the amount that I save by going through the part is exactly delta of, the, of, the, of that component. And if I don't go the, through that part, then the amount that it costs me is exactly the, del the hat delta. So remember, our main theorem is that the deltas are always at most minus one half. The hat deltas are always at most three halves. So in other words, if I, if I go through a chain or if I go through a, a component in a, in a, with a two edge cut, I'm, I can always save at least one half. But of course, I have to balance this out. There might be other chains, other block, other components I can go through. So it turns out that yeah, this is right intuition. And I, I won't go through the, the, the proof, but the idea hopefully is clear. You, an, an, a cycle contains this my edge E, if and only if it contains both edges in the two cut, right? So this gives you a bijective correspondence between an even cover containing the edge in the overall graph and pairs of even covers in each of the components. And if you just run through the calculations with the definitions, because we define the deltas to be minus two, because of this minus two in the definition of delta, um, you, you get exactly get this result. All right. All right, so this is um, this is a restatement of our main result. So our, the third condition is really saying that the, the two costs are, are always balanced. So the, co the savings of going through a chain or going through a, a, a component mm -hmm. is, and if you, if you, if you only save a half by going through a component, then you also don't cost that much by not going through the component and, and, and vice versa. So these tight components are um, not so important, so let's skip this. So I kept saying the word chain because this, these are, this, this is what really happened. If you give me a subcubic graph, I could have a lot, it's a two-connected subcubic graph, I can have a lot of these, if I have a two cut, then 
one component of the tukat is really you can think of it as a as a chain, um, where you, you can you, you could have, you could have just one block in the chain, um, and we define the closure of the component or the closure of the chain as just closing up the end edges of the chain, and for each block. I can also think of it as closing the ends of the of the block in, in the chain. And, and similarly, if you run the similar calculation as before, what we get is that is that the delta of the chain is just the sum of the deltas of the closure of the blocks, and the hat delta of the the closure of the chain is again the hat delta of sum of the hat deltas of the closure of the blocks. So, in other words the savings that I get by going through a chain is the sum of the savings of each block in the chain. And the cost of not going through the chain is just the sum of the costs of each block in the chain. Okay, and the chain is tight if only every block is through Let's skip that. So now, now let's talk about the extremal example. So remember um, the examples that violated our desired bound of plus one the first example was K4 minus, right? K, so K, K4 and you delete an edge. So it, it's sort of a similar construction. So a rooted theta chain is you take an edge and you take two internally distinct paths or, um, with endpoints that are the same endpoints as E. So it's just the picture is here. And if this chain was just a path of length two and this, then this is exactly just K4 minus an edge. And so this is a rooted theta chain. An unrooted, just a normal theta chain is just an internally distinct union of three subcubic chains. So I don't have a picture here, but just imagine that instead of this, a single edge here, you also had another chain, right? So um, these, these are technical definitions. So really the important example is this K4 minus one. And more generally, if you had a, um, if both of these chains were just some paths, let's say both chains were paths of length k with k internal vertices, then you, if you do the calculations, you what you get is that you again violate this bound by uh, one half. So what's really bad if if I'm forced to go through this edge, then. It, it, in the worst case, it doesn't really matter which chain I choose. To go through and not through, they have the same sort of, they have the same cost and the same savings. So, so this balance in this condition just says that um, it, they have sort of the same amount of savings and the same amount of cost. So it doesn't, they're, it, no matter which chain you choose, it's they're equally bad. And the, it turns out that these are exactly the, the the extremal graphs that these are the only graphs that, that violate our bound of plus one. So these are um, essentially the only extremal examples. So, so again, here is our, our main theorem. Um, so it turns out um, we, we had this condition that G minus E is two connected, but that was really only for this case here. If I'm forced to not go through an edge, then I, want, I don't want to have like this in country the situation where I have a long cycle. But in the other cases, if, if my edge is already in a two edge cut, then I, that, that's only better for me because it, then, then I'm going through an even longer chain essentially. And, and I can always save even more. So this two connected condition is only really needed for the second statement. Okay, but we, we actually, so we, we characterize all the extremal cases. So we, I can tell you exactly when equality holds. So, Delta of G and E, so going through uh, some graph, I can always save at least a half. And the only time I save only a half, so I would like to save more, but sometimes I can only save a half. But in that case, I know that this pair G and E forms a tight balanced rooted data chain. So it's basically a picture like this, where just imagine two uh, long paths of the same way. Those are really essentially the only cases where I'm forced to I'm, I can only save a half by going through this chain. Similarly, if G minus E is two connected and the cost of not going through this block is three halves, so if equality holds, then G minus E is a minimal theta chain, which means I have 
three internally disjoint chains with the same endpoints. And of course, the simplest case is um, when each of the three chains are just paths of length two. In other words, it's, it's, this is a K23. And, and delta plus hat delta is always the most zero. So again, the, um, we're characterizing when, when these inequalities hold with equality. And we can um, also characterize the tight cases. Well, let's skip that. But what we, act, what we get from this is we get a structural characterization of these data chains. Um, so actually, let, let me skip this right now. But so so the, the, the two cases we've been looking at were when delta is, is minus a half or when hat delta is equal to three halves. But there are like, there's, there's one other case where delta is equal to minus one and hat delta is equal to one. And that's really what I'm, we're, we're interested in, in the general, like the TSP walk problem. Because I don't, for, a, uh, for a TSP walk, we don't really care about forcing an, or avoiding an edge. We just want the best even cover overall. So if, if delta is equal to minus one half, then I know that hat delta is equal to one half or at most one half, which means the additive constant that I get for an even cover by avoiding E is, is at most one half. Similarly, if hat delta is three halves, then I can then delta is um, at most minus three halves, which means, again, remember that de delta had a minus two in the definition, which means, um, the additive constant that I get for, with the even cover is again at most one half. So there's this sort of the, the middle case where delta is equal to minus one and hat delta is equal to one. Which, and I actually get a plus one in the additive constant. And it turns out we can, all, we can also characterize those cases. So what we get is that um, if you don't care about going through or not through an edge, just generally, if given a simple two connected subcubic graph, um, the excess of G, the minimum even cover has excess at most N plus N2 or four plus one with equality if and only if G is a congruent to K4 or G is a minimal theta chain. So a minimal theta chain, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I defined it clearly here, but we, we can prove a structural characterization of it that what we can get is um, essentially K23, right? You have these three internally disjoint paths of length two. And I can blow up a vertex of degree two into a four cycle like this. It turns out that this operation preserves all the deltas and hat deltas. And here I, I blew, I took a K4 minus an edge and I blew up to a two vertex of degree four, degree two. But you can you can keep blowing up degree for you get new vertices of degree two and you can keep blowing them up. But so this is a K4 minus a blow up of a K4 minus. But um, if you blow up a K23, that satisfies um, this bound with a, with a plus one. And it turns out that those are the only graphs that, that have this extremal property. So the minimum excess of a graph is equal to this N plus N2 over four plus one. It has equality if and only if either K4 or it can be obtained from K23 by blowing up degree two vertices sequentially to a, a diamond. All right. So um, let, let me try to give you an idea of some of the proof here. So let's 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 try to put, try, try to try to prove the first statement. So it's, it's the first statement is really the most interesting part. So if, I, if I'm forced to go through an edge, then I have delta at most minus one half with equality if and only if I get a tight and balanced root data chain. How do I prove such a thing? Well, let's, let, let's look at the case where G minus UV is disconnected. So if I delete the endpoints of E, then I get two dis, disjoint components. Then of course, I'm forced to go through my specified edge E. So of course I had to go through, I had to choose one of these chains to go through and the cost of, and the other chain, I'm, I had to not go through it, obviously. So I had to look at the cost of, of not going through the other chain and I had to look at the savings that I get from going through one chain. And if I look at the, if I, and 
if I look at the two choices that I have, and if I calculate out the um, the deltas, and you, you, it turns out you, you get you get the, the you get what we get what we want. Let me skip through this. Okay, so so we so we can now assume that G minus U V is connected, and if my specified edge is in a two edge cut, then again I, I can sort of I can look at each component separately, and I can sort of apply induction. So let's assume that E is not in a two edge cut. And it also does not disconnect the graph by doing the end vertices. And the two cases that we get is, is it essentially looks like this. Um, so it just up to symmetry, if you just look at the structure of this, this subcubic graph, um, these are the two cases that you get. And again, so let's look at this left example here. I'm forced to go through my edge UV. I essentially have two choices. I can go through U1 and come, go across and go to V2, or I can go through U2 and go across and go to V1 to complete my cycle. Of, of course, I can use U1 and V1, but then I'm not using, using this middle chain here. And it turns out that's, um, that's too costly. But if, if I just go through the middle chain, I have two choices and, it turns, and if you do this sort of similar calculation of balancing out the cost and the savings of, of the chains, you, 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 get the, you get the right bound. And, and it's a similar idea here. So when, if this chain, if, this, if there is no like bridge between these two parts, then what we get is we just get two, one to the component. And now I'm, I'm forced to go through this edge. I essentially have four choices. So I can choose either U1 or U2, and I can connect it to either V1 or V2. And now you look at all these, these four choices, you look at the sort of the costs of, of the other cha the chains that I'm not going through and the savings of the chains that I'm going through, you, you do these balancing out calculations and you, you, get, the, you get the right down. Do that. And the, uh, the second statement is um, much simpler because I can essentially just reduce it to the first statement because like, what am I really asking for? If I ask you to not go through the edge, it's just the same thing as saying, I just delete the edge and find an even cover. Right, because I, it, it's a much weaker condition in some sense. So I just delete the edge and I just look at the area neighborhood around the edge and you see, okay, I, um, I, I, if I delete the edge and then I'm going to create a vertex of degree two, I'm gonna suppress that new vertex of degree two and may, maybe, maybe force to go through the edge in the smaller graph and apply induction, or I don't force it to go through the edge and I again apply induction. And you turn out you get the right one. So this is really just a reduction to the, the first statement. Let me also skip that. So let, let me just say a few words about the algorithm. So the algorithm is, is essentially just follow the proof. So what we're going to do is I'm, we're going to define essentially two algorithms. We're given a subcubic graph G and an edge E. I'm going to return an even cover containing the edge, or another algorithm that returns an even cover not containing the edge. Right? And because we have this structural characterization of all the extremal examples, we can determine exactly when the deltas are exactly one half, minus one half and when the hat deltas are exactly, exactly three halves. Um, and in all other cases, um, so I, I, I probably should have said this earlier, but all the deltas and hat deltas are always half integral because it's, it's n plus n2 over four, right? But n plus n two is always even because um, n plus n two, you can think of it as n three plus two times n two. So the vertices of degree two are counted twice and the number of vertices of degree three is even because it's just a number of odd degree vertices. So the, the deltas are always half integral. So in all the, uh, it, if you're not in these extremal cases, then we know that the deltas and the hat deltas are at most minus one and one respectively. And of course we can't actually compute these deltas exactly because you, that, that's NP hard to do, um, but we can always give an upper bound for it. Like what, what is the worst possible scenario? The worst possible scenario is that the delta is equal, equal to minus one, half, minus one and hat delta is equal to one. So we just, for the algorithm, we just say, we give an, we give an approximate upper bound on the delta. We just say, 
if it's in this extremal case of minus one half, we just say we just pretend it's it's the worst minus one half and plus one half case. If if the hat delta looks like it's going to be three halves, then we just we just assign three halves to it. And in all other cases, we just pretend it's the worst possible case and just assign minus one and one. So we basically just compute this worst case estimate for the deltas. And essentially, and now we're basically just going to run through the proof, of, in, um, the entire proof with these worst case estimates. And because our proof works in the worst case, um, in the worst possible case, like our algorithm also gives us this guaranteed bound that, so our algorithm will eventually yield an even cover that has this bound where n plus n two over four plus the big delta plus two or an even cover not containing my edge with a, with a constant of hat delta, hat delta. But these hat deltas are all, always at most one half or three halves. So again, the algorithm is essentially, there's, there's only one thing we need to do for the algorithm except follow the proof is just to say, because we can't compute the deltas exactly, we just give an, a worst case sort of upper bound for it. And we, it, it actually, it, it does take some work to, to um, determine when we're in these two extremal cases. But other than that, we just say it's, okay, just assume it's the worst possible case. And because our proof, proof actually still works in the worst possible case, the algorithm should also give us a, a, a even cover that's at, mo at worst this bound. Okay, so again, in particular, if you give me a cubic graph, then my algorithm will return a graph with, uh, will, will return an even cover with excess at most n over four plus a small constant. So to summarize, our main theorem was that, was to look at even covers and prove this bound of n plus n two over four plus one. And, and we had equal, we actually uh, characterize the extremal examples as K4 or minimal theta chains, or in other words, graphs that can be obtained from K23 by blowing up degree two vertices into four, two, two four cycles or diamonds. And of course, we prove this by uh, actually looking at a, a more refined statement or a stronger statement of even covers going through or not through an, through an edge. So, of, and because of this observation earlier that the minimum access is exactly related to the the minimum length of a TSP walk, the immediate corollary is that given a simple two to the subcubic graph, the minimum length of a TSP walk is five n plus n two over four minus one with equality if and only if either G is K four or this K two three blow up. More and moreover, we can find this TSP walk in polynomial time. And immediate corollary of that is that we get a five four approximation for the cubic TSP. So some remaining open questions. So our bound is this five fourth bound is, sort of is best possible only in the sense that there are graphs that achieve this, um, that have, there are graphs whose minimum length um, TSP walks have, have length five and over four. But of course, like we, the, the way we achieve this approximation ratio is that, okay, we find a TSP walk of length five n over four, and we know every TSP walk has length at least n. So we know it's at, at worst within five fourths of the optimum. So we're, we're really not saying anything about any, any sort of lower bounds or how close it is to the actual optimum. So it might be possible to actually, like if you, if you actually go down to look at the graph and say, okay, well, what what is the the minimum length of a TSP walk look like, and then it might be possible to improve the approximation ratio. So the our, our upper bound is best possible in general, but the approximation ratio could still be improved for cubic graphs. And it's possible that our sort of techniques can be applied to more general graph classes. So uh, this is something we're we're still working on. Um, it's. It's, it's possible that we could sort of maybe prove this for bounded degree graphs or something similar. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Oh, perfect. Uh, if we could all thank our speaker in some way. Uh, chat here. Uh, so are there any questions for uh, Young Ho? Any questions in, on e in either audience? It doesn't, doesn't appear to be. So uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. And uh, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, you know, for, for all of us here at USC, you know, uh, this is our last day of classes. So happy last day of classes. And it's not quite the end of the semester, but uh, this will be the last seminar that we'll have of the semester. So um, Yong Ho gave us a, a great sort of final talk of the semester. I really appreciate it. Um, but as far as, uh, as far as other weeks go, um, I'll have to keep you updated in, you know, probably a month or so. And, and uh, we'll have some, some, you know, yeah, new new speakers then. But uh, thanks everyone for uh, for a great semester. Yeah.